thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times in our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. I'm Daryl Burton, one of the pastors here at Church of the Resurrection, and our passage today is from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the Spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united, and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purpose, but with humility, think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, innocent children of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scriptures. Today we continue our series of sermons on Paul's letter to the Philippians in which we're looking for the keys to finding joy in our lives. So joy in particular in the midst of adversity. And today we're going to be talking about the kind of adversity that comes with conflict. I don't know about you, but when I'm in conflict with somebody, I don't feel much joy. When I feel conflict around me, I don't feel much joy. A couple of years ago, we were having a major conflict in the United Methodist Church. It's still ongoing. We just have put it on pause while we have the coronavirus. It picks up again next year. And in the midst of that conflict, I've got to tell you, I had the most joyless two years of ministry in my life. Not from anything that was happening here at Church of the Resurrection, but just from that feeling of conflict, conflict. And, and it seems like we're surrounded by conflict. When I'm in conflict with my wife, LaVon, uh, we don't feel much joy in our relationship. And, and uh, so I was thinking about, in fact, I had to call her, I, you know, we're, we've been married almost 40 years. We don't have a lot of conflict. Actually, we do. It's a lot of little things, no real big things. And so I called her on the phone before the sermon. And I said, hey, what have we fought about lately? And she couldn't think of anything. And I couldn't either. I'm like, come on, surely we can think of things that have really irritated each other. And uh, there are those kind of things. So for us, an example is uh, there are little things like when I brush my teeth, I leave the water running the whole time I'm brushing my teeth. And that just irritates her. It's like we're running out of water. And so, I've, you know, she comes up, she turns the water off right in the middle of my brushing my teeth. I have some reason why I do that. She leaves the bath or the bedroom closet light on. I just, it just irritates me. Like, I'll come in there after an hour and the light is on. Like, wait, you're worried about my 10 seconds of water and you're leaving the light on? We go to the Lake of the Ozarks pretty regularly, and uh, we, we, uh, we love going down there. And when we're going, I know where the cheapest gas is. The cheapest gas usually is in Climax Springs, uh, in the way that we're going. And, and uh, yet, LaVon doesn't want to wait for Climax Springs to get gas, because she always wants to know that we're not below like a half a tank or something. So, so we're on our way down, and, and we get to Clinton. And it's, it's 10 cents a gallon more in Clinton. And she's like, hey, we're going to stop and get gas. I'm like, no, we're not. We're going on to Climax Springs. It's just another 45 minutes, and it's 10 cents cheaper. She's like, do you need the extra 10 cents a gallon? I'm like... That's the kind of stuff we fight about. Now, uh, those kinds of fights don't really, you know, th th they're really not a big, big problem for us. They don't take away the joy of life. We just get irritated with each other for a minute or two. But every once in a while, we'll have something we have a strong disagreement about, and we find that we feel in conflict. We let, lose joy, and, and then somewhere along the way, you know, we make up. And as we make up, this is what happens. Either she sees the light, or I see the light, or we both see the situation in a new and different light. And as we do, as we come back together and we either agree or we agree to disagree, we find joy. Now, we deal with conflict all the time, not just in our interpersonal relationships with our spouses or our parents or our children, but it's also with our neighbors. And, and yet, it's not just that kind of you know, conflict we deal with. It's a much broader issue, really. In fact, today, I would say in my 56 years of living, I don't remember another time where there was greater conflict in our society than this one. I suppose maybe in the 60s, but I was a little kid, and even in the 60s, I don't know that it was, it was so 
It, it so permeated every part of our society like it does today, conflict. I, I was thinking about this this week. I was reading a, uh, an editorial in the Casper Wyoming Star Tribune, and, uh, and it was talking about the polarization in Wyoming. And I guess Wyoming, they, the way they talked, I've only been there a couple times, the way they talked, it sounds like you know, there's a lot of agreement in Wyoming, but, but, uh, but they noted that uh, at this time, uh, Republicans, they were talking about Republicans in particular, Republicans are tearing apart Republicans. And, and people within the same party who don't share the same views on this or that issue, they said, are now considered traitors. And the editorial board rightly noted that the polarization or conflict, this is a quote, threatens the very nature of who we are. I mean, it's possible for polarization and conflict to threaten the very nature of who we are as Christians, as human beings, as a society, as a country. 94% of Republicans today say we are strongly conflicted as a nation. 92% of Democrats strongly conflicted. And the thing we're conflicted about, <laughs> it's, it's politics. It actually goes deeper than that, but politics certainly is, uh, is what we see on the surface. Now, I was thinking about the things that we're conflicted about, and I just asked our video team, can you just pick up some of those things, you know, from, from newscasts that capture the conflict we see and, the, and, and feel all around us today? And this is what they put together. Take a look. With the virus spreading like wildfire, a battle is raging over one of the key tools used to fight it, face masks. It is a scapegoat. Are you going to allow the government to tell you you have to wear a mask? No! All right, we feel that kind of politics, that kind of uh, controversy and conflict, not only in politics, of course, but in other areas of our lives. We're divided over uh, whether we wear masks or not, what happens with our kids going back to school, can we play football in the fall or not? I mean, it seems like everywhere we turn... You know, all of these things are feeding into each other, and we feel massive conflict. Now, what happens in our marriage is the only way that we survive with these little tiny conflicts and sometimes the bigger conflicts is that Levon and I uh, treat each other, we try to treat each other, even in the midst of our conflict, with humility and grace and love. Like, that somehow goes a long way in tempering the impact of the conflict. And yet in our society, if we don't temper the, the conflict we feel, the inner feelings of, of conflict with other people or theirs towards us, with humility and grace and love, we just tear each other apart. Now, President Trump suggested that democracy, as we know, will end if the Democrats are elected. I, I just don't believe that. There are some Democrats that have suggested that if, that if America re-elects President Trump, America cannot survive for four more years. I simply don't believe that. What will destroy American democracy is our continued conflict without grace, humility, and love. The Republicans and Democrats, it's not within their power to destroy American democracy. I think our democracy is stronger than that. Our democracy has to, has to do with the rule of the people. But what can destroy our democracy is our unwillingness to set aside hate. So last Friday, we remembered the 19th anniversary of 9-11. And as we remember that, we saw a picture of what, lo what hate looks like. And, and we remember it. Some of you are too young to, to actually remember sitting and watching the World Trade Center's fall. But as we saw that, it was just the unimaginable, unthinkable that any human being could do this or any group of human beings could do this. But if you take conflict and you take away any sense of humanity, you take away a humility, you take away grace, you take away love, and all you have left is a brewing hate, you end up with things like 9-11, utter destruction utter inhumanity, hate. Now, when we do this, when we're in conflict and we're in conflict in this way and we don't have that tempered by uh, humility and grace and love, what we find is uh, a total lack of joy in our lives. So this sermon series is about finding joy and, and because we've lost a lot of joy with the conflict that's going on around us, we're gonna be looking to Paul's letter to the Philippians, a letter of joy in which 14 times in just four chapters, he talks about joy. He uses the word kara or one of its vari variants. This is a word that can be translated as, as it's, in its variants can be translated as, uh, as uh, joy or rejoicing or even gladness or sometimes gratitude. Grace is uh, the root word, kara, uh, grace. 
anyway, this, uh, this is found 14 times in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And, and what's surprising about that, so, so scholars call this his letter of joy, his epistle of joy. But what's surprising about that is he's in a prison cell waiting to find out whether he'll be executed or not. And yet he has this joy in the midst of his adversity. We learned last week that joy is unlike happiness. Happiness is often defined as something that results in a pleasant feeling that comes from pleasant circumstances. If circumstances are good, you feel happy. But joy isn't based upon your circumstances. It's based upon your convictions. And I would add the quality of your character. That is what enables us to have joy even when our circumstances are joyless. So I mentioned in my e-note this last week that conflict isn't new. Conflict is a part of being human. Anytime you have two human beings together, you're going to have conflict. I've had people you know, talk about how they left a church because they disagreed with the pastor, and I'm like, wow. And that's happened here at Church of the Resurrection sometimes. Here's the thing, and I've shared this with some of you before. If you want a pastor you agree with all the time, then you need to go online and pay 20 bucks and get an ordination certificate, which has, in my mind, virtually no value because you have no training to, to support that. But, but if, if you want to do that, you get your certificate and then you look in the mirror and you preach every weekend to you. Otherwise, you're going to disagree with the preacher somewhere along the way, including me, probably in this very sermon. And, and if you want to be a part of a church where you agree with everybody who's there, you better lock yourself in the bathroom and have church by yourself every Sunday morning because you won't even agree with your family members sometimes. Levon and I don't agree about everything when it comes to how we interpret the Bible or how we live out our faith. So part of what it means to be human is to learn how to deal with our conflicts, how to disagree agreeably. Every one of the New Testament books, so all 27 New Testament books, if you look at them carefully, you'll find that some part of every one of them was written to deal with conflict in that particular church or in a group of churches or a segment of Christians or to a particular individual who's leading a church. Every one of them, all 27, are written to deal with conflict. Jesus, at the Last Supper, you may remember after the Last Supper, what he says, he prays, and when he prays to his Father, he says, Father, let them be one as you and I are one. Why does Jesus have to pray that that night? I mean, this is a whole, you know, Jesus is, is just pleading with his Father, please make them one as we are one. Why does he have to do that? Because he knows the moment he leaves, they're going to get in fight and con fights and conflict with each other. They already have been doing that throughout, the, throughout his ministry with them over three years. They have been in conflict again and again. On that same night, Jesus said, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, right? And why did he have to say that? Because they were going to be, you know, they were going to have this tendency not to love each other, to tendency to get irritated with each other, and, and in the midst of irritation, to divide from one another. I mean, you look at how many thousands of denominations there are within the Christian faith around the world, and how many hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, I don't know, non-denominational churches, because I can't even get along with any of the other churches, you know, that are like-minded with my own. We can't even link together. I mean, I'm not saying that's true for every non-denominational church. I'm just simply saying that we as Christians have a real hard time sticking with each other. And Jesus knew that. This is why Paul has to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have, have love, I am a no, noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's why John in 1 John chapter 4 says this, beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. What is love? Love isn't a warm, fuzzy feeling as it's described in the New Testament. I mean, there is a word for that, but this word is agape, which which is a dogged determination to care for you, regardless of whether I agree with you or not, regardless of how you've treated me, I am going to try to care for and love you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be concerned for you and put your needs before my own needs. I'm gonna seek to bless you. I'm gonna be kind to you. That's what this kind of love looks like, even though we disagree, right? This is the, the dominant message throughout the New Testament is that we're called to show that kind of love to one another despite the fact that we are going to disagree. It's also why so much is said about forgiveness in the New Testament, this struggle with, with getting along with each other. So over and over and over again, Jesus addresses forgiveness and tells his disciples that they have to forgive each other. And Paul writes to the churches and he tells them they have to forgive. So in Colossians chapter three, a passage that I share at almost every wedding ceremony that I do, because I think it's important for husbands and wives, for, for people who are getting married to be able to hear these words. But it's also true, it was written not for marriage, it was written for life. Paul says this, therefore as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. I love that. Bear with each Put up with each other, he says. And forgive one another as if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. I mean, Paul's anticipating. He knows what's going to happen when Christians get together. I mean, I mean, the first two siblings you remember in the Bible are, are, are Cain and Abel. And you remember what happens there? They end up, you know, Cain ends up killing his brother Abel. I mean, conflict is just a part of the deal all the way through. And we either learn to overcome that 
with grace and humility and love, or we destroy other people or are ourselves destroyed. Right? We find ourselves living very lonely existences because we can't find anybody else we can fully agree with on everything. We're going to be in conflict. As the pastor of this church for 30 years, I can tell you with some regularity, I get letters from people saying, hey, I got to leave the church. I don't agree with you about this or that, or I don't agree with this other pastor or this person. And and I'm like, well, God bless you. You know, I, I you know, wish you well as you go find another church where the pastor always says everything that you agree with. It's just the thing is when we only find people that we agree with all the time, sometimes we miss out on being stretched or challenged or we miss out hearing what, what God might really say to us. Listen, I tell people before they join Church of the Resurrection, I'm not always right. I, I spend 20 hours, you know, fretting over my sermons, reading the commentaries, praying, you know, seeking God. What do you want to say to your people? And, and even then I know I'm not going to always get it right. And I tell people, you have perfect permission, you have full permission to disagree with the preacher sometimes. I only hope you'll take seriously what the preacher's saying, me or any of our other preachers, but it doesn't mean we're always right, and it's okay to disagree. I mean, that's just kind of a given here at Church of the Resurrection. We want you to think for yourself. This is a church where we ask you not to check your brain at the door of the church. We want you to be a thinking person and to engage and ask questions. But we also want you to be able to ask questions of your own convictions when somewhere in Scripture or something the preacher says might challenge those. And maybe the preacher's wrong, and maybe you're wrong but not to divide from one another because we can't quite agree on everything. All right, Philippians 2 then. So last week we looked at Philippians chapter 1. Today we're looking at Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians chapter 2, um, Paul is going to address conflict. So it starts, uh, it starts with these words. Uh, Paul says, complete my joy. There's the word joy. Complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united and agreeing with each other. Now, why does Paul have to write that? except that he knows that they are not agreeing with each other. They are not currently being united. They are not agreeing with each other. They don't have the same love, and they're not thinking the same way. Now, I don't think he's saying that they have to be uniform and believing everything exactly the same way, but I think he's saying, you know, listen, you're followers of Jesus, so that should unite you, and I want you to have the same heart for Christ. I want you to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. I want you to seek to follow him and, and to find a unity in that. Now, we know that Paul is going to call out, so if you get to chapter 4 in in Philippians, you're going to find he's going to call out two women in the church who are in conflict. So there in chapter 4, we read these words, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. Hmm. So he sends this letter to be read in front of the whole church. Can you imagine how embarrassing it must have been to be Euodia and Syntyche who who are now called out by Paul's letter, the founding apostle of their church, right in the middle of the church service because they're in disagreement. I'm I'm urging them to come to agreement on the Lord. What are they disagreeing about? Oh, we don't know. Paul doesn't tell us. But it clearly was an agreement that had gotten all the way 800 miles away to Paul when he's in a prison cell in Rome. He'd heard about it. And then Paul says this about these women. He says, these women have struggled together with me in the ministry of the gospel. These are leaders in the church. These are are people that he feels a great affection for. And they had been working in the same direction, you know, for the gospel, and yet they couldn't agree about something. Now, it wasn't just these two women. When we get to chapter 3, which we're going to study next week, we're going to find that Paul talks about an even greater movement within early Christianity, two movements within early Christianity that were tripping people up, and they were pulling people in opposite directions. Uh, One group were uh, what we might call the legalists, or Paul also calls them the Judaizers or the circumcision party. And these were people who uh, we might think of as the sort of arch conservatives of that time. And these were people who believed that the Old Testament law, the Hebrew Bible, the law, that was the only Bible that Christians had, that, that Christians you know, Gentiles who had become Christians were to follow the law as the Jews had done. They were to be circumcised and they were to follow all of the 613 laws that were found in the Hebrew Bible or as many of them as they could. And so these were the legalists and they believed, you know, to be a Christian includes doing, you know, following the letter of the law completely. Then there were the libertines and the libertines were people who believed that Jesus came to create a new covenant for us. And because of that, he offered us forgiveness and grace and love. And that's really wonderful. And they took all of that and, and the promise of eternal life. And then they said, but that, that really doesn't have anything to do with how we live our daily lives. I mean, we're, we have freedom to be able to do whatever we want to do as long as we're not hurting anybody. So those were the libertines. Those were like the, the you know, m- most liberal of liberals in the first century church. And so you had these two extremes in the church, and, and Paul is, is trying to navigate a middle way between the two, saying, listen, we are to, you know, we have freedom, and we're also to live lives that are worthy of Christ. And, and so he was calling for both grace and holiness and holding these things together. This was the conflict within the church, or at least one of the conflicts within the church. And there were many others. You know, is it okay to drink wine? Which holy days did you have to observe? And a whole host of other things. And for that reason, because there was all of this conflict, people disagreeing about a host of different things, 
Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2. This is his antidote to the divisiveness and the conflict in the early church. In fact, why don't you read this out loud with me? It's on your screen. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I mean, this is a tall order here. And, Jesus, and, and Paul says, this is how we do this. This is how we, how we live in the midst of conflict towards one another. Right? This is what love looks like, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, considering others better or above yourselves, looking not to your own interests, but to the interests of other people. And then he says, and have the same mind or mindset as Christ Jesus. So now he's saying the, the pattern for what it means to be a human is Jesus. So let's see how Jesus lived and what he teaches us. And this is what he says. And, he, and, he, and now some believe is quoting an early Christian hymn. Some scholars believe that this was a, a hymn that was sung by early Christians. Others say no, but it's, it's Paul's own poetry. But it is written in a sort of poetic form. And he says, he says of Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Even death on the cross. This is a powerful picture of who Jesus is. And, and at this time, the church is still, you know, it, it's just trying to formulate its theology, right? It's going to take a couple hundred years, several hundred years before it finally comes up with the Nicene Creed, you know, in which 270 years later, it comes up with the Nicene Creed in which, in which it's going to, you know, affirm clearly what the church has come to believe over time, and that is that Jesus is both God and human. But the New Testament already sees Jesus as God who has come in the flesh among us, and he came and he humbled himself. Right here is, here is God who has humbled himself and come to become like us in human flesh. And he takes the role of a slave. That is, he comes to serve other people. He doesn't come to be served. He doesn't, he doesn't ride in on a white stallion and have everybody serving him and meeting his needs. Instead, he comes and he finds the poor and the broken and the sick and the outcast and the hungry and the thirsty. And he's meeting their needs as Jesus walks on this earth. And Paul says that, that's what it looks like to be human. That, that's how you deal with conflict. Of course, you're going to have conflict. So when you have conflict, then, then care for the person who, who you're in conflict with. Show kindness to them. Humble yourself before them. Don't think first about yourself and your hurt feelings or, 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 or your position, but instead think about that person and how you can bless them and care for them. And maybe in that way, the world might be changed. Maybe in that way, the conflict might be resolved. Or if it's not resolved, at least, at least it's settled with an agreement to love each other and not to destroy in the name of our conflict. God came to us in Jesus. And, and scripture has this picture of, you know, humanity being in conflict with God at this time. Humanity's in conflict with God and doesn't even realize it is, is, is rebelling against God and disobedient to God. And God comes to us in Jesus and he doesn't wag his finger at everybody and he doesn't destroy them. Instead, he serves them. And then he lays down his life in order to save them. This is a picture of how we're meant to live our lives. Paul shows us what this looks like repeatedly in his epistles. In Romans 12, 21, he writes, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How easy it is to become overcome by evil. How easy it is for us to find hate welling up in our hearts or anger or, or, or bitterness or wrath or whatever. And Paul says, don't be overcome by those things. In the middle of your political wrangling, in the middle of trying to resolve you know, issues that your society faces or your church faces or your marriage faces, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I love that well-worn well -worn quote by Martin Luther King Jr. drawn from the teachings of both Jesus and Paul when he says, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. In the protests against racism, I believe in the just cause of ending racism in our country. Right, racism still exists in our country, and, and there is a place to be able to stand up and say, this isn't right. right? And, and I think we have to be able to do that together. All of us have to be able to do that and say, this is not right. And you have to be able to stand up sometimes. You have to be able to protest against injustice. And at the same time, when we're protesting against injustice, we have to do it with love. Because whenever we fail to do it with love, whenever we, we fail to uphold our, our righteous you know, protest, and we do that in a way that reflects hate, 
or anger or, 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 or when it reflects uh, hurt towards other people, when, when it's name calling, when, it, when, it's, when it's violence or, or when it's looting or any of these other things, we undermine the very just cause that we're speaking up for. As Dr. King has said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I, I believe that there are... Uh, that most police officers are, are trying to do a really good job. They're doing an admirable job in a really tough set of circumstances, and it's just gotten harder over the last year. And I also know that there are police officers who are bad apples, just like that there are preachers who are bad apples. And, and some of those folks need to be taken out of their jobs and put somewhere else where they're, where they're not hurting people, right? Where the power has gone to their heads. The, that's not most, that's not, that's not very many, maybe. It's, it might be a very small number, but that very small number has a huge catastrophic impact on a large number of people. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Like many of you, I watched Thursday night's Chiefs-Texans game. So I'm a big football fan, a big Chiefs fan, and, and uh, I, I watched from home, and, and uh, I was surprised when I saw at the beginning of the game. I didn't know this was going to happen, but at the beginning of the game, before the kickoff, both teams came out, uh, the Texans and the Chiefs, and they walked to the middle of the field, and here you had 106 20-somethings and 30-somethings on opposing teams, black and white and Latino, standing in the middle of the field, and they locked arms together as one. This was a moment of unity, an expression of unity. And, uh, and as I was watching this, I thought, how remarkable. Like, they're about to go head-to-head -head in this football game, and yet they've got their arms locked right now. And, and they were trying to say, Patrick Mahomes helped organize this, along with tech, the Texans' Deshaun Watson. And, and they said, you know, what we want to do is find a way to show our unity and to show our unity in favor of love and against hate, in favor of, of anti-racism and against racism. We want, to, we want to be people who are going to try to use our power and our influence for good. That's what they were saying. That, that was the aim, right? And, and, and in that, they were doing exactly what the Bible teaches, speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves, right? They had a moment. They had an opportunity to be able to say, you know, there's things that are going on in our country that aren't right, and, and we want this to be a country, a nation, that treats people with equality. Like, I just looked at it, I thought, wow, how cool is that that they're doing this? And then I listened to the boos in the stands. Uh, here, here were the statements that showed up on the Arrowhead screen while they were standing there in this moment of silence. We support equality. We must end racism. We believe in justice for all. We must end police brutality. We choose unconditional love. Can you imagine booing that? We believe black lives matter, and it takes all of us. Yes, I know that there are some people who look at Black Lives Matter and suddenly they go to an organization that has also, you know, that, that maybe several members created this name as a hashtag years ago, and, and they think that that statement, Black Lives Matter, is about that group. But the 106 players on the field, they didn't think that. They weren't talking about a group somewhere. They were just talking about a truth. Black Lives Matter, and that needs to be said because for much of our history, that hasn't been how we acted, right? And it doesn't mean that other lives don't matter. It doesn't mean blue lives don't matter and white lives don't matter and all lives don't matter. Of course, all lives matter and blue lives matter. But in a world in which for centuries, we've said that black lives don't matter so much, that phrase is important to be able to say. And as a nation, we're in conflict even about that. I was grateful for the 106, 20, and 30-somethings on the field who were saying, we're on different teams, and I don't think they've just meant the Texans and the Chiefs. We're Republicans and Democrats here on the field. We're black and white. We're conservatives and liberals. But we stand united in wanting to make our country a more just and good nation. I think of uh, the powerful words of John Wesley. He wrote these in a time of conflict in his own, you know, among his own people in England in the British Isles. This was in the 18th century, and this is the preface, in the preface to his notes on the New Testament. He said this, would to God that all the party names and unscriptural phrases and forms which have divided the Christian world were forgot, and that we might all agree to sit down together as humble, loving disciples at the feet of our common master to hear his word, to imbibe his spirit, and to transcribe his life in our own. I, I love Republicans. I just do. I love Republicans. I love Democrats. I really do. I really love Democrats. I love libertarians and independents. I don't always agree with them, any of those groups, but I do love them. 
And I do want good for them, even if I disagree with them. I have family members who are upset about wearing masks, and I think we should be wearing masks. And you know what? We love each other. We may disagree, but we love each other. I'm going to vote for one of the two people who are running for president. I'm not going to write in anybody else's name. I'm going to vote for one of those two people. If the other person is elected, I'm going to love them too. I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to hope good for them. And I'm going to do my part in trying to help our country be the country I think it needs to be, regardless of who's elected as president. The defining mark of the Christian life is love. It's what Jesus showed us when he came and served. It's what he showed us when he cared, when he healed, when he gave himself for us. Now, next month is the 30th anniversary of the existence of our church. We started 30 years ago, 1990. And uh, we have a theme for the entire month. So it's our campaign. It's the last month of the political campaigns for all the offices across the country. It's going to be our campaign here at Church of the Resurrection. And, uh, and for that campaign, we've taken what Jesus said is the second great commandment, love your neighbor. Now, he quotes Moses when he says it, love your neighbor. And we said, this is what we're going to drive towards every Sunday, every weekend that month. We're going to be talking about love your neighbor and who's your neighbor and how do you love them. And, and each sermon different and crafted and, and helping us think about this. And, and that theme is going to show up in a variety of ways. We, we have t-shirts that we've made up. And I'm going to put my 30th anniversary resurrection t-shirt on now. It, it says, love your neighbor. It's got a hashtag on it, which is a way of saying, you know, this is something we hope people have conversations about. And, uh, and we have these uh, printed up so that every one of you, whether you live in Kansas City or not, you could have one. We're underwriting part of the cost. So your cost is only five bucks for a really nice t-shirt. This is my first, this is just our first one we've gotten here. Love your neighbor. Hashtag love your neighbor. Seven times it's on there. Why seven times? Well, because there are seven days in a week. And our hope is that every day of the week you remember, this is my calling. Jesus says, this is what it means to be a human being. I've got to love my neighbor. We have a, a campaign that's going to be going on. We have yard signs. This is just a sample, but yard signs made up. Uh, love your neighbor. Hashtag love your neighbor. We're hoping you're going to put those in your yard, right? You're, you, you know, we have like 2,000 of these made up. And we're going to put these in our yards. And, and when people drive by, you're going to just remind yourself as you're driving into your own house, hey, this is my calling today to love my neighbor. But you're going to remind, remind the other Christians in your community and the Jewish people who look to the same commandment. Hey, this is our job to love our neighbor. We're going to put these out by all of the political signs that are going, going in the islands, you know, around us uh, in the streets and, and on the street corners. And we're going to put this in the middle of all those signs because this is our campaign in the month of October. Our campaign is in the midst of a time when our country is so divided, we got to remember, this is what it means to be a human being, to love your neighbor. So I want to wrap it up in this way. So it's a funny thing that happens when you begin to show love to people who you're in disagreement with, who you're in conflict with, is the conflict begins to dissipate when you show kindness to them. And what you begin to feel is joy. I want to end in this way. <clears throat> this is Grandparents Weekend. I don't know if you know that or not. It's Grandparents Weekend, so if your grandparents are alive, I want to encourage you to, uh, to let them know how much you appreciate them. Stella, if you're watching this, my six-year-old granddaughter, let your Mimi and Papa know how much you love them and your Grampy G. So Grandparents Weekend. On Grandparents Weekend, uh, and this is also, of course, the week that our kids went back to school, I was thinking about how much we love our granddaughter, Stella. Uh, she went to school in first grade this last week, and I just thought I'd show you this picture. This is her first day of school, and, uh, and this, is, uh, this is at her Grampy G's house. He was an elementary school teacher. He's retired, and because her school is meeting online, she went to his house, Cobble Cove School. He made up the sign for her. Stella's first day of first grade, and then you can see Stella sitting at her mommy's old desk from when her mommy was a little girl in front of her iPad as she's learning in first grade. Here's the thing. I love that little girl more than life itself. What's the kind of world I want for her? I don't want a world where people hate each other. I don't want a world where people are calling each other names all the time. I don't want a world in which, in which uh, we have to continue to protest for rights for little girls like her. I don't want her to grow up in a world in which there is such animosity. I want her to know that we're called to love even those we disagree with. I want her to be able to stand up and speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves, but I want her to do that with love because love is the most powerful tool she has to be able to change the world. And I want her to know that joy is found when you can love even in the midst of conflict. But in order for her to learn that, I have to model that for her. And you have to model it for other children. All right, so I want her to know that it's not selfish ambition or vain conceit but it's considering the needs of others before herself. And when she does that, 
she'll find life. And that leads me to one last little thing I want to show you. Uh, I figure, you know, you can say almost anything if you can have people, you know, see a cat or a dog somehow in a funny, funny pose. So here it is. I was, uh, I was getting ready to leave my house the other day, and I'd let our dog out, and she went out, he, uh, she went out on the back porch to meet up with our, with our cat, Biggie. And there's Mabel and Biggie, and, and I saw them doing this. I just wanted you to see this. So there they were, and, uh, and, and there's Biggie, the cat, and Mabel, my dog, and, and they're just laying against each other, licking on each other. And, uh, and as I was watching this, I just couldn't help but think, that that was a picture of what I hope for in our country. Not that we're going to lick each other, but that if my dog and cat can do this, maybe Democrats and Republicans, black and white, liberals and conservatives, can find some way to practice kindness towards one another, even in the midst of our difficulty and our disagreements, that we can show grace, humility, and love. We can listen and learn from one another. We can disagree with each other. We can stand up for what we believe is right and do it in a way that reflects love. And when we do that, we're going to find joy. Here's my challenge for you today. One simple challenge. Somebody you disagree with, you know, somebody you really disagree with, I want you to find some ways, at least one, to bless them this week. And as you're blessing the person you disagree with, I believe you're going to find joy. Let's pray. Oh God, you know how hard it is to love those we're in conflict with, how hard it is to practice kindness when we're frustrated and you know that there's a lot of frustration going around today, a lot of misunderstanding, the, the tendency to de demonize one another, call each other names, and, and think the worst instead of the best of each other. And we've all been guilty of it. I have, and every person listening to this sermon has been guilty of this. You know it. Please forgive us. Wash us and make us clean. Help us, O oh Lord, to stand up and to speak up for a more just and loving and kind world. Help us, O oh Lord, to show mercy and grace to one another and to not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. May that mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, who took on flesh, who became a slave, who laid down his life for us. To that end, we offer ourselves, O oh Lord, to you. Holy Spirit, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.